Hi there, and welcome back to BookFlow's video series, Essential Steps Toward Your Story. Today, we're talking about plots. Writers often get super freaked out by the idea of plots. Please don't. Plots are fundamentally just the problem that your character is trying to solve. I'm in love with someone who doesn't know I exist is a problem. I've been swept into another land by a cyclone. That's a problem. Hey, I found this cool gold ring. Oh, but it's owned by the Dark Lord Sauron. Okay, that's a problem. My best friend has started bullying me. Even that is a problem. Some people call this problem the external want. I want this person to love me. I want to get home. I want to destroy this ring. I want to teach a bully a lesson. The problem and the character's desire to solve it drives the external action in your story. As I said in the last video, there are two layers of action in a novel or short story. The external want, which can also, you can also think of as the problem the protagonist needs to solve, and the internal want, which is the emotional need that the protagonist needs to satisfy. And those two things should be related. From the last video, you've probably decided what kind of emotional journey your character is going to take. The plot question is simply this. How can you, the writer, give the character these experiences that will bring about that particular emotional journey? How can you take them from one place on the virtue vice chart to a different place? If your character is moving from cowardice to bravery, you have to choose a problem that will test their courage and force them to be brave. If your character is moving from pride to humility, you have to choose a problem that will be humbling. Plots are tests of character. That's all they are. In life, people say everything happens for a reason. Well, that may be true and maybe not, but in a plot, it is literally true. When something meaningful happens in life, we call it fate. When something meaningful happens in a story or novel, we call it plot. In the workshops I've given across the country, I've met a lot of writers who feel comfortable developing characters and uh, emotional lives for them, but they struggle with plots. Many people ask what a plot even is. Simply put, a plot is the stuff that happens in a story and the order in which it happens. You may not realize it yet, but you already know how to write a plot. You work with plots every day. And frankly, any kid on earth can tell you the formula for how to write a story. In his book, Bambi vs. Godzilla, acclaimed playwright David Mamet says that the foundational plot structure for any story is this. I'm pretty sure that this looks familiar. At the beginning of any novel or story, it's important to show what ordinary life for the protagonist is like. Once upon a time, we see the life that is about to get interrupted. Usually we get a sense of the main characters, the setting, and the usual emotional state of the protagonist. We might get a hint of relevant backstory, but it's important not to back up your story too much or explain too much at the beginning. For example, in Cinderella, it's enough to know that she was a lovely young girl whose mother died and whose father left her in the care of a wicked stepmother. The circumstances of her mother's death are not really that important. Was it cholera? Was it tuberculosis? Was it an accident? Not relevant. The reason her father marries this particular horrible woman, also not important. We don't need to sit at the sick mother's bedside or attend the second wedding. We get it. In Jane Austen's Emma, Emma has a comfortable life with her father. Her mother died. She had a very lenient governess. We don't need scenes of her childhood. We don't need to see the governess in action. We, we get the idea with a few broad strokes. 
Some stories begin in medias res, that is, at the point of highest action, and then return to an introductory scene. That's great! If you're afraid that an ordinary day might seem boring to the reader, feel free to open with an exciting moment. Not all of these moments have to be in chronological order. However, it's important to establish a scene in which the protagonist's before is shown, or else the after will not have any resonance. Remember, it's all about cause, effect, and meaning. Something of emotional significance should happen in this opening moment. This should not be a scene of people quietly sitting around a fireplace. I mean, that is literally what they're doing in Emma. But then Emma, who's impressed with her own matchmaking skills, which have sent the governess off into a happy marriage, announces her intention to find a suitable match for Mr. Elton, the village vicar. In Macbeth, Macbeth is coming home from battle and meets three witches who give him some vital information. Harry Potter is reluctantly dragged along on his cousin's birthday outing and speaks with a snake at the zoo. Something happens, but that something is meant to reveal the foundations of the character, the protagonist's starting place. And then one day, this is the moment that your high school English teacher called the inciting incident. It is the thing that happens that sets the character on a path toward his or her destiny. And then one day, an invitation to the ball arrives at Cinderella's house. And then one day, a letter from Hogwarts arrives at Harry Potter's house. There's a lot of letters that show up sometimes. And then one day, Frodo realizes that the ring his uncle left behind belongs to Lord Sauron. And then one day, a cyclone sweeps Dorothy away to Oz. You get the idea. This is the first step on the journey that will take your character down the path toward their ultimate fate. So it is basically where your story truly begins. It's the interruption of the protagonist's routine. Pro tip. Don't wait a long time before giving the reader this scene. If you do, it'll seem as if nothing is really happening in your novel. And just when things were going well. What's the most memorable scene in Cinderella? You may be thinking of the scene where the fairy godmother appears and Cinderella's dress, dress transforms, but please allow me to remind you of another moment midway through the movie. The moment in which the mice and the birds make Cinderella a dress. Cinderella has, up to this point, put up with a lot of nonsense from her stepsisters and her stepmother. She has worked hard and she's completed her part of the bargain which is that if she finishes all of her work, she can go to the ball. Meanwhile, her little animal friends have taken an old dress that belonged to her, her dead mother, and they have transformed it. They've used cast off beads and lace that the stepsisters discarded and updated the dress so that Cinderella can wear it. She puts it on dashes after her stepsisters to go to the ball, but when those evil wretches notice, thanks to their much smarter than them stepmother, that some of their tossed away belongings have been used to modify the dress, they rip it to shreds. When my six-year-old self saw that scene, I bawled my eyes out. This is what Aristotle calls a reversal. It's when things have been going well and then all of a sudden they are worse than ever. This is the point, usually roughly halfway through your story, where for lack of a better phrase, things get real. This is a midpoint. It's the scene of huge emotional importance that takes place usually about halfway through your story. Some might even call it the climax of Act One. Usually it's a moment in which something goes horribly wrong and the main character has to face the truth about what they're willing to do to get what they want. Your nice dress got torn up, but you're going to the dang ball anyway. After 
the emotional outpouring of the climax of Act One, that midpoint, your protagonist regroups and goes in pursuit of her goal again. The deal might get a little better, but it's definitely going to get worse again. A lot worse. Cinderella's fairy godmother shows up. She bibbidi bobbidi boos a dress and a couple of glass shoes, and Cinderella goes to the Ding Dang Ball where she meets Prince Charming. But the clock strikes midnight. She has to get out of there before the last toll of the bell because at that moment, the spell will be over and she'll be left in rags. So she heads home and she's perfectly happy. She has a glass slipper, she has her memories, but the prince is looking for her. He sends out the duke to try the glass slipper on every maiden in the kingdom. Naturally, the duke ends up at Cinderella's door. Her stepmother is suspicious and all of a sudden, Cinderella finds herself locked in her attic room. When all of a sudden is the final reversal. When the character finally sees the utter truth of her situation. Up until this point, the actions of Cinderella's stepsisters and of her stepmother have made Cinderella sad. But now they're pissing her off. This is what Aristotle calls a recognition. It's when a character understands their own situation. In Cinderella's case, she recognizes that nothing is going to change. Her stepmother is a liar and a cheat. That is wrong, and Cinderella is going to put things right for herself. It seems as if all is lost at this point in the story, but it isn't, not quite. The protagonist is about to make one last desperate attempt to get what she wants and face the consequences. In Cinderella's case, the mice help her escape from the attic and she shows up just before the Duke leaves. The Duke happily insists he'll try the glass slipper on her foot, but the stepmother trips him and it smashes into smithereens. The Duke gasps, but Cinderella is not worried. Why? Because she's got the other slipper in her pocket. Game over. And they all lived happily ever after. Once you reach the end of your novel, your story, your audience has moved on to Cinderella doesn't need to pack up her stuff or take a nostalgic stroll through the garden in the stables. She leaves and counts on the mice to catch up with her. They all lived happily ever after or like died is something I added to the model, which happens in the case of a tragedy like Macbeth or Romeo and Juliet. These endings don't require much filigree, maybe a nice moment of someone on their wedding day, as, or as in the original fairy tale, a lovely image of Cinderella's stepmother and stepsisters dancing to their death in heated iron shoes, or a moment where Macduff carries in Macbeth's severed head and everyone says hail to the new chief, Malcolm. <laughs> These are the tentpole moments that will guide you through your work. These are the big scenes. For every scene though, you need to make sure that things are working on a scene level. Sometimes we have an idea for one or more of these big scenes, or even for a smaller scene, and we want to be able to capture those ideas even if we aren't 100% ready to write them down. If you're using Bookflow, the best way to do that is to capture the ideas quickly using our simple outlining tool. Just choose your project, click Scenes, and then click Create Scene. Give your scene a name and write down a short description of what's in that scene. These descriptions are your outline. You can keep outlining by writing another short description, or you can start writing the scene itself. You can view your descriptions as a list, as an outline, or in what I like to call post-it note view, where you can drag and drop scenes into a new location. Every time you move a scene description to a new place, the scene itself 
moves with it. So it's easy to write the parts you're ready to write and organize them later. If you haven't checked out your free trial yet, why not try it now? See if you can put up some of your story's tentpole moments. There's a PDF worksheet with questions to help get you started attached to this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video where we'll be talking about the trickiest part of all, making meaning out of our stories.